Next. So um, I want to, in the meantime, I, I left SRI. I took over two programs from a man named Paul Barron. We were joking earlier about who invented the, the Internet, and there are many fathers of the Internet, but there is only one grandfather, and that's Paul Barron. Paul Barron is a very quiet, you probably have never seen his name, probably never seen him on television. He was the engineer at the Rand Corporation in 1965 who invented packet switching. And packet switching is a technique by which data moves around the Internet. Uh, of course, it was in the public domain, so he never made a dollar out of that, that invention. But he, he invented, he was the, the real father of, of the ARPANET, did not want to run the ARPANET, but at, uh, in about 74, 70, actually about 73, um, he left academic research to start a career as an entrepreneur. And he started building a number of companies that today are on, uh, on NASDAQ. He, uh, and he, le he had started two projects on, in networking on how to link groups of people through computers. Up to then, computers had been linked together to do computation, which is, you know, was a normal, a normal thing to do. But we thought there was much more potential in linking people and computation together through computer networks. Uh, the ARPANET at the time was about 52 computers all over the world. Well, not all over the world, but in US, Canada, and, and, and Western Europe. And uh, we started building conferencing systems that would tie experts together in various fields. And we started observing, because we were the first ones to do that, so my project developed the first network conferencing system. And we were observing groups of people uh, interacting through computers, and we were beginning to observe some very interesting thing. These people were very frustrated because they wanted to communicate with lots of people very quickly, but they only had a keyboard. So th they had, essentially, there was a psychic component on top uh, that we could observe on top of the typed communication, but we could also capture everything else. And our system was a system that married um, electronic mail, the way you know it today, uh, instant messaging, and a couple of other, the other features that could be done together simultaneously. So you could have electronic mail with a delay, you could have electronic mail with no delay, and you could have instant messaging and private messages, which doesn't exist on the web today. So we, we had a really exceptional system at that point that we were doing research on. And in analyzing the transcripts, we would find strange things. For example, we would find people answering a question before the question was asked. So somebody in, you know, somebody in Chicago would say, uh, hey, uh, you know, there is uh, this kind of research has been going on in biology, and I think you guys should look at it. And then uh, 10 seconds later, there was a message, which was already in the system when the first one was typed, that said, by the way, is there research in biology that would relate to this? Okay. So we would find those, those coincidences, and they came more and more. And people described having almost be, not being out of their body, but being a, a sense of community when they were sharing the computer space with these other people. So we, we wrote an article called Computer Conferencing, a, uh, an Altered State of Communication with Dr. Arthur Hastings, who is now at uh, the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in, in, in Palo Alto. And it was sort of a seminal article. And a few people read that and said, you know, you guys should really explore that. See if there is a psychic enhancement that's done by, that's created by the ambience, by the atmosphere of computer conferencing, by depriving people of the normal channels of communication where they can't see each other, they can't touch each other, they have to communicate through this lousy keyboard. So, um, one, uh, there was a, one television executive in San Francisco who uh, said he was willing to finance a special conference to do that. In the meantime, we had moved our system away from government networks. We had moved it to TimeNet, which was a timeshare network, the network of the timeshare corporation. So we had, we had a completely commercial system, 
we could do whatever we wanted on that commercial system, and the time was being paid for. So uh, we designed a, a series of psychic experiments on the network, which was the first time that had been done. We selected 12 participants. Ingo was one of them. We gave him a terminal in Manhattan. Uh, Hal was, was a participant. Brendan O'Regan, whose name is still current in a lot of the early psychic research, uh, was a participant. Uh, Richard Back, the author of Jonathan Livingston Seagull, was very interested in this. We gave him a terminal in Florida. And uh, so we, have 12, we had 12 participants who were trained in using the network. And then um, there were scientists from the Institute for the Future, where, where I was working, where I was doing this research. And so we started this conference on current issues in psychic research. People could come into the conference at any time. They could chat. They could talk about their research. They could file. They could send files into the system. Uh, and they could talk about ongoing stuff. But on top of that, we put a series of experiments. 